Hello friends, welcome to UGC EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shonangif, Faculty Department of English, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Today we are going to learn the introductory module on university wits and their contribution to the growth and development of drama before William Shakespeare. This module is written by Professor Bisheshwar Chakraborty, who teaches English at Jharam Raj College, Government under Bidyasagar University. Possibly by the time you were aware of the growth and development of drama during Middle English period and leading to the early part of the Elizabethan period. The university wits are the university graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. They contributed a lot to the to the setting of dramatic performances and dramatic literature before the arrival of William Shakespeare. In this particular module, we are going to analyze the university wits in details, their contribution, the features of their drama leading up to the platform for William Shakespeare. We are also to explain the contribution of different university wits in respect of their dramatic traditions. Let us start with a, with a quotation by George Sainsbury, who speaks in terms of the university graduates of Inver University of Oxford and Cambridge during the early Elizabethan phase as the university wits. He is the first person to categorize a bunch of writers or dramatists, playwrights who emerged in the early Elizabethan phase and made their influence felt are known as university wits. In measurement of contribution, they are very significant because they marked the arrival of important dramatists later on in the stage like Ben Johnson and William Shakespeare. Sainsbury says, in the first place we have the group of university wits, the strenuous if not always wise band of uh, professed men of letters, at the head of whom are Lilly, Marlowe, Green, Peel, Lodge, Nash and probably Kidd. In the second we have the irregular band of outsiders, players and others who felt themselves forced into literary and principally dramatic composition, who boast Shakespeare as their chief and who can claim as second to him not merely the imperfect talents of Chettle, Mundy and others whom we may mention in this chapter, but many of the perfected ornaments of later time." Uncut. So goes Sainsbury. Now friends, we should begin with the features of these playwrights plays first. Edward Albert in his History of English Literature published in 1979 argues that the plays of university wits have the following categories or characteristics. Number 1, there was a fondness for heroic themes such as the lives of great figures like Muhammad and Tembaline. These university wits explode to the full potential to the popular figures like Muhammad and Tembaline. In Ed, uh, Mar Christopher Marlowe used the term Tembaline and theme of Tembaline in his wonderful production entitled Tembaline the Great. Heroic themes needed heroic treatment, great fullness of variety and splendid descriptions. If we examine all the plays written by the university wits, their contributions are the flowers of the time. Long swelling speeches, the swelling speeches, long dialogues move us. The handling of violent incidents and emotions. If we look into the theatrical performances written by the university wits, they are trenched with bloodshed, murder, motive of revenge and they have excess of emotional exuberance. 
these qualities excel and had restraint only too often to lead loudness and disorder. Often these particular habits of life lead to disorder and which set as contrast to the Greek ancient theatre houses as we think of. The style was also heroic. By heroic style we mean the chief aim was the, to achieve strong accents and strong uh, robust lines and their heroic actions as demonstrated by the tragic protagonists. We can refer to the bombast and mouthing sentences and phrases in the, in the utterings of the protagonists that we are referring to. At the same time, the best example can be Marlowe. The result is quite impressive. And in this context, it is to be noted the most medium for such expression and extension and extensive use of blank verse which lead us to esoteric and sufficiently elastic to bear the strong pressure of the expansive method as augured and augmented by the university wits of the early Elizabethan period. The themes were usually tragic in nature. Most of the university wits use tragic themes as the subjective discourse during the onslaught of their players. And the dramatists were at a rule too much of the earnest to give heed to what was considered to be the lower species of comedy. Actually comedy was treated as a lower species of genre during that time, but much of the attention was paid to tragedy. The general lack of real humor in early drama is one of the most prominent features. The drama was not humorous. Humor was considered to be a scene in a dramatic performance during that time. And all the writers contributed to the up uploading and upbringing of the dramatic tradition of the early Elizabethan period before the advent of Ben Jonson and William Shakespeare. Now, after a, f a discussion of the characteristics in general, let us concentrate on individual writers and their contributions. We can start with John Lilly, who was between 1554 AD and 1660 AD, and his important plays include The Women in the Moon, a most excellent comedy of Alexander and Campesi, Shafo and Faw, Endymion, Galithia, Love's Metamorphosis. By the suggestive titles, you can understand there is a tendency to a fever or to refer back to the historical past as the comedy of Alexander. At the same time, Lily is noted for his beautiful cadence and subjective corpus. He is the sole representative of romantic comedy among the university wits. Lily's plays are full of lovely songs and they exerted a considerable influence on later dramatists. The phrase that comes in mind and Lily faded charm. They are unparalleled. The subplots are not always effectively neated up to the main story, but on the whole Lily's contribution is enormous to the subjective development of the early Elizabethan theatre in the hands of university wits. We also think that the new idea of comedy is been planted by the able hands of John Lely. Let us talk about George Peel, another important contributor, individual contributor of university wits. George Peel was born in 1558 and died in 1597. His life was very short. Born in London, educated at Christ Hospital at Oxford and came to be a literary hack and freelancer in London. His important plays include 
the famous chronicle of King Edward the first, the rambling chronicle play, the battle of Alciger, the love of King David and fear Bathsheba, the old wife tell, the old wives tell 1591. Pill's style sometimes appeared to be crude to the point of being absurd, but with his gift for occasional lyricism, fantasy, fluency, Peel is also noted as one of the important contributors among the university wits who set the tone for William Shakespeare and Ben Jonson and later on other theatrical giants to perform their shows. After Peel, the name that comes to our mind is Robert Greene. Robert Greene was born in 1560 and died in 1592. So, he lived only for 32 years, but he contributed a lot to the growth and development of drama before William Shakespeare. He was born in Norwich, educated at Cambridge and Oxford and then took a literary life in London. He was treated as a Londoner and his important plays include the Honourable History of Friar Bacon and Friar Bungby, the Scottish History of James IV, Orlando Furioso, Alphonsus, King of Aragon and the King of Aragon is an imitation of Marlowe's Tambourine. Orlando Furioso is abducted from English translation of Ariosto. The Scottish history of James IV is not a historical play, but based on the imaginary occurrences in the life of the person concerned. The honourable history of Friar Bacon and Friar Bangby is undoubtedly his best creation and most noted and celebrated. Green's plays are characterised by craftsmanship a skillful mixture of realistic and native background with a collage of images. His style is not brilliant, he is not noted for exuberance of images, but he is noted for methods and also an important style that is why he is a prominent member of the university which before William Shakespeare. After Green, we can go ahead with Nash and Lodge, two important contributors of among the university which are Thomas Nash and Thomas Lodge. Thomas Nash was born in 1567, whereas Thomas Lodge was born in 1557. If we look into their birth years, they are almost contemporary. Born in Lowsoft, educated at Cambridge and then went to London to eke out living through literature. It is now established the fact that the finished Marlowe's Dido, but only surviving play Summer's Last Will and Testament, a satirical mask. Thomas Nash is also noted for his brilliant cadence and style and therefore, he is recalled as an important contributor among the Elizabethan University wits. Thomas Lodge, born in London, educated at Cambridge. He was basically a student of law, but he discarded legal profession and took to literary career. He probably collaborated with Shakespeare in Henry VI and Thomas Lodge is also a champion in scholastic presentation and at the same time he is known to the as an important contributor among the university wits. Among the inv individual playwrights of the university wits, we cannot forget the scholarship and performance made by Kidd. Kidd is an important dramatist among the university wits. Thomas Kidd was born in 1558 and died in 1594, born in London, educated at Martin Taylor School and adapted as a literary career. Of his extant plays, the Spanish tragedy 1585 is often been considered as a trademark tragedy 
that ushered new area of tragedies. Modeled on Senecan plays, Spanish tragedy is based on blood for blood sake or a revenge play motif. The division of acts, the bloody climax and the revenge itself are the chief concerns of the Spanish tragedy. The Spanish tragedy established a new genre in English drama, the revenge play or revenge tragedy. In respect of that, the contribution of Thomas Kidd is enormous. To many critics, Thomas Kidd also prompted William Shakespeare to write his revenge plays like Hamlet. To only the extent play known to be kids is Cornelia. So, the importance of Thomas Kidd is never been uh, sidelined or can never be bypassed. So, after Thomas Kidd, we may move into the most important contributor among the university wits, Christopher Marlowe. I think among the audience and the participants today, they can recall some of the important works by Christopher Marlowe. His life span 1564 AD to 1593 AD, born at Centbury, received education there and at Cambridge and took literature as a profession and became attached to the Lord Admiral's play, players in London. His plays, all tragedies were composed within five years of time. Proper appreciation of Marlowe can be made if we can put our emphasis on the dramatic performances if we look into his tragedies carefully. Among his important tragedies we may mention Dr. Faustus, the Jew of Melta, the Tamberline the Great and all these tragedies he, uh, there are beautiful use of poetic verses and the presentation of the poetic protagonist. Tamberline the Great is about Tamerline and his conquest of the world. In Barabbas, we see the world conqueror through money. Barabbas is the central protagonist in the Jew of Malta performed in the year 1591. By far the best among all his plays is Dr. Foster. Dr. Foster performed in 1592 is a super is a product of the Renaissance scholarship. He is a product of superhuman knowledge black art and Dr. Faustus invites Mephistopheles to butter away his soul for all voluptuousness. Dr. Faustus is possibly one of the best tragedies written by the mighty hands of university wits. Edward II. Edward II is an important tragedy by Christopher Marlowe, where Marlowe attempted a chronicle play designed for writing a historical record of original Edward II and the play exercises some of the important episodes like the killing of uh, Edward II, like banishment of Gaveston and the opening scene of the play sums up how Gaveston is liked by Edward II and which is a cause for dislike for the, uh, for the people of his own country. It also causes a kind of superior diplomacy between British, the British and the French. Edward II among the Marlowian texts proves to be an important text where the crooks between the Britishers and the French is being exercised perfectly. In Edward II abdication scene happens to be one of the premier scenes among the uh, uh, pre Shakespearean uh, dramas. Edward Albert comments on Christopher Marlowe. Let us read the comment. Though not the first to use blank verse in English drama, he was the first to exploit its possibilities and make it supreme. His verse is notable for its burning energy, its splendor of diction, its sonorous richness its variety of pace and its responsiveness to the demands of varying emotions. Full of primary colors, 
His poetry is, ch is crammed with imagery from the classics, from astronomy and from geography, an imagery barbaric in its wealth and splendor. Its romance and power led Ben Jonson to coin the phrase Marlowe's mighty line. But its might has often obscured its technical precision and its admirable lucidity and finish." Unquote. We should not forget the contribution made by Christopher Marlowe, the most important contribution of Marlowe that he paved the way for William Shakespeare. We cannot deny the fact that Christopher Marlowe first time introduced comic scenes in a tragic play, which sets out a departure from the Aristotelian framework and definition of a tragedy as a serious drama as defined by Aristotle in Poetics chapter 5. Friends, after going through module 30 on introduction to university wits, we can sum it up in this way. In this particular module, we looked into the role of the university wits. We tried to embrace the meaning and the definition of university wits. We studied the characteristics or basic features of all university wits and their contributions individually. At the end, we elaborated the individual contributions and their signal contributions and significance in the dramatic tradition before William Shakespeare. I hope it helped you a lot. Thank you. We have all at least heard of William Shakespeare. His stories have reached through the centuries and permeated our culture, leading to our own modernizations of his timeless tales. It would be easy to credit him with the birth of theatre as we know it, a father of sorts. We know him, we love him, let's stick with him. But what about this guy? Or oh, this guy? Or even this guy? Do you recognize them? These are the people that worked and wrote alongside Shakespeare, and in some cases made him the great playwright we know him to be, the University Wits. University wits were a group of well-educated Elizabethan playwrights who wrote plays for both public and private court stages. They helped to redefine the structure and poetry used in dramatic literature, and while they didn't always work together cohesively, they are generally viewed as the most prominent group of writers of their time. And it all begins with this guy. I guess you could call me the leader, a rabble rouser of sorts. Robert Greene is considered one of the first professional authors of his time, as before him the concept of supporting oneself primarily off of writing did not exist. I started out writing poems, novels and pamphlets. I, I really love pamphlets. That's where you get your fan base. But what can I say? I really love theatre. So I'm focusing on my playwriting. Through his writing, Green has secured a very influential presence, becoming a prominent public figure. I think my most favorite and most renowned plays are Friar Bacon and Friar Bungie, The Scottish History of James IV, and Orlando Furioso. Christopher Marlowe, Robert Green's fellow wit, maintains an equally powerful public presence. I'm working on a piece that deals with the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. 
think I'm going to call it the massacre at Paris. Although that's confidential, of course. I've had issues with plagiarism in the past. It is also rumoured that Marlow works part-time as a special agent for Sir Francis Walsingham's intelligence service. It is reported that he had unusually long and unexcused absences from school, as well as a mysterious supply of extra money. Marlow was also arrested several times for suspicious activities such as illegally manufacturing counterfeit coins, but charges were dropped almost every time. Due to legalities, Marlow refused to comment on this topic. Well, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Working alongside Green and Marlow, is Thomas Nash, a collaborator of both playwrights. Noted for his daring and controversial writing, Nash's career is one marked by making a stir. Well, I went to Cambridge. I was on scholarship for most of it, but had to leave early. I still published 13 pieces of work, though. Not bad for a college dropout. My favorites, personal favorites, are... Summer's Last Will and Testament and The Isle of Dogs. I wrote that last one with Ben Johnson. Great guy, although it was deemed seditious and never got published. Is there any truth to the statement that you left because of your involvement in a, quote, raucous student theater production? <laughs> I'll let you figure that one out on your own. It was for personal reasons. One somewhat scandalous milestone in Nash's career was the Harvey Brothers feud, a literary war over whether or not Puritan ethics should be supported in dramatic and other literary art forms. Nash's writing was personally attacked, specifically a preface he had written for Robert Greene's book, Menophon. Nash responded to the attacks by publishing his own defenses of theatre, furthering the feud. Another university wit affected by this feud was Thomas Lodge. In defense of his writing, he published a pamphlet, Defense of Poetry, Music, and Stage Plays. The pamphlet was banned by authorities officially, but still circulated privately. Lodge gains most of his inspiration from traveling, doing some of his best work on voyages to the Canary Islands, Brazil, and the Straits of Magellan. However, he recently retired from the business and has moved on to a medical practice. John Lely, originally a celebrated novelist, is another member of the University Wits. After devoting himself to playwriting, he began writing for the court, producing eight popular plays. In this profession, there's only one position you want to go for. Master of Revels. Now, I worked for the Royal Court for 13 years. I applied twice for the Mastership of Revelry. And did I get it? No. Despite his commendable efforts, Lily never attained the recognition he desired. The final member of the University Wits is George Peel. Despite his tendency towards reckless behavior, Peel was known for his adaptations and translations of Latin classics. I like to put an edge on things, if you know what I mean. I like to take the classics and bring them into the modern age, like I did with the arraignment of Paris. The university wits work together, building their reputation as highly educated, talented writers. 